be great. Welcome. It's a huge pleasure to be here today, welcoming you to the second Northern Rail Farming Conference. I'm Susie Russell, coordinator of the UK Community Supported Agriculture Network and a member of the NRFC advisory group. I'm hugely excited by the programme for this online and face-to-face -face blended conference and the wide-ranging speakers and groups who we'll be hearing from over the next few weeks, including the five who are talking to us at this opening session. Before that, however, I'd like to introduce Ellen Pierce, coordinator of the Northern Real Farming Conference. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you, Susie, and welcome, everyone. Um, we just wanted to say a little bit about the story of the Northern Real Farming Conference to provide some context. Um, so the Northern Real Farming Conference story really begins um, in spring 2020, when local farmer uh, Rod Everett came back from the Oxford Real Farming Conference with a passion and a mission to set up the Northern version. Uh, we wanted to provide a complementary platform to the Oxford Conference, but focused on Northern farming, recognising our different landscapes and heritage. Um, we wanted a space to come together to dream and rethink and to share practical um, experiences of regenerative and socially just ways of farming. And we wanted to look at fair and low impact ways to bring food to markets and to kitchen tables and for distribution. So we focus specifically on the north of England and Scotland and the unique landscapes and cultures of these regions. And last year, the Northern Real Farming Conference was born in the middle of COVID-19 and we ran the first conference as a virtual event last autumn. So this year we have two events. We have this um, online conference and then an in-person gathering in Lancaster on the 2nd and 3rd of December. Uh, you're all very welcome to join us for that. So do book tickets if, you, if you're able to and you haven't already. Um, and we welcome you to collectively and collaboratively support the transition to agroecological, nature friendly and regenerative methods and to nurture local supply chains. And we hope you enjoy sharing case studies, successes and challenges and building the northern networks to help us to expand our capacity and capability to embrace the significant changes and challenges that face us that I'm sure we're about to hear more about. So I just wanted to thank our supporters for this year. Um, thank you to the Farming the Future Fund, um, whose grant funding enabled us to maintain momentum after last year and provide some network building um, and additional events this year. Thank you to the Nature Friendly Farming Network. Uh, you'll have a chance to meet them on next Wednesday at one o'clock if you'd like to chat to them um, in the conference space. And there's also, also information about them on Kiko Chat. And thank you to Organic North who distribute and supply organic veg from small producers around the North. And again, there's information about them in the conference platform. The Northern Real Farming Conference is run in partnership with the Oxford Real Farming Conference team. So thank you to them for all their support. And also thank you to all the support from Food Futures, which is North Lancashire's uh, food partnership. So many of our network members are helping with the, with the event. So if you need anything from us, please uh, just get in touch. You can message me directly um, in the chat in Zoom now, or you can email, you can use any of the help functions around the conference. And uh, we hope you have a brilliant week um, and we hope to see you in Lancaster if you're joining us there as well. Thank you, Susie. Thanks, Alan. So I'm gonna open this session by um, just introducing it. Food and farming have a huge role to play in our efforts to combat the joint challenges of the climate, nature and health emergencies. COP26 has been very disappointing. We're outraged at the lack of time devoted to food and farming and at the lack of support for poorer nations fed largely by small farmers who are already, already experiencing firsthand the devastating effects of climate change. If we're to meet these challenges, agroecology needs to be firmly on the agenda and the one thing we can take away from COP is the need to keep up and increase the pressure. In the UK, as we transition to a new post-Brexit framework, we are pushing for agroecology, nature-friendly farming and regenerative farming to be recognised, promoted and supported. Here in the north of England and Scotland, we must find ways to support our farmers, including those on the uplands, at the same time as ensuring we all have access to real good food. Agroecology supports biodiversity, sequesters carbon and protects our habitats and soils. Despite the poor outcomes from COP and the uncertainty over the new policy framework, there is reason for hope. The increased demand for and interest in local nature-friendly food is growing. 
Now is our moment. Let's seize it. This session brings together five inputs from experts in the field to provide a context and hope as we join together over the next few weeks in the North for this conference. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Natalie Bennett, who's going to talk to us about opportunities and challenges for farming in the North of England and Scotland, moving on from COP. Natalie Bennett is a Green, Green Peer in the House of Lords, which she joined in 2019. She was leader of the Green Party from 2012 to 16, taking part in televised leaders' debates in 2015. That year, the Greens won more than one million votes. She brings the experience of decades of campaigning for change on three continents and the knowledge of what's being done well and badly from cities and towns across the UK. Natalie's made her home in Sheffield, but she grew up in Australia, where she began her working life as a journalist after studying agriculture at the University of Sydney. Natalie is vice chair of the all party parliamentary group on agroecology. Welcome, Natalie, and over to you. Well, thank you very much. And it's lovely to be with you. Um, and I was just watching the, uh, the chat box and seeing someone talking about horizontal hailstorms. Well, actually, I'm down in London. I've just been speaking to pupils at St. Paul's School for Boys. Um, and they offered me a classroom, but I thought I might sort of get some fresh air out here because I'll be in the house for the rest of the day. So that's where I'm speaking to you from. And you can see a bit of blue sky behind me. Um, and it's interesting that actually we were talking quite a bit about food and food systems when I've just been talking to the boys. It really is coming up the agenda and there's a real focus. And I think what we've seen with the now Agriculture Acts and Environment Act is we've really started a conversation. And we've of course, of course got uh, government's response we're gonna see quite soon um, to the Dimbleby Food Report, which you know, I'd still like to see it going further, but broadly is an excellent report. Uh, and what's really clear is the current general political landscape is we are now in the age of shocks. COVID is one of them. You know, we're seeing huge amounts of weather shocks. Uh, Canada just today is really suffering from that. And securing our food supply and getting a healthy food supply is an absolutely crucial part of what needs to happen that just isn't happening now. And you know, I sometimes speak to farmers, and indeed, I was at the um, at the Northern Farming Conference, making a nice parallel. Is you know, I usually go to the Oxford Real Farming Conference, and sometimes the Oxford Farming Conference. This year, I'm also doing both of the Northern ones, which shows the fact that I was invited. Shows there's a real desire for change and drive for change, and a real dissatisfaction with what the government's currently doing. And I think you know, agroecology. Um, has to be the foundation of our future. When you just look at how incredibly inefficient industrial farming systems are, the fact that we're feeding vast amounts of um, what could be perfectly good human food to animals in factory farms, that we're relying as a, as a human species, more than 50% of our calories come from just four crops, which is profoundly insecure. Um, and the UK, you know, we desperately need to eat massive amounts more of fruit and vegetables, and we need to be able to grow them here. So I saw um, someone in the, in, the, in the chat was saying, you know, I uh, want, want to become a farmer, want to become a grower, uh, but the real problem is access to land. And, you know, I'd really champion the, the Kindling Trust in Manchester that's doing great work in this area and preparing people to start businesses. But that access to land is a huge problem. And so, you know, one of the things we really have to get on the agenda, and it's something I'm working on, is land reform. You know, we have to restore the ring of market gardens around towns and cities, reform, restore local food systems. And we have to change the way we farm. And a lot of that is not within the gift of farmers. You know, I think down in um, down in Devon is actually a Green Party member I know. Uh, he used to grow potatoes, and he told me that well, we grew potatoes, and there were three different packing sheds to choose from, and then there were two packing sheds, and then there was one packing shed, and the last packing shed, local packing shed, closed, and we had to get out of potatoes. So what we're thinking about, you know, the food systems were, is really key. Is we have to build those up, and we need policies that that would make that happen. And that means, you know, we didn't get anything like what we should have got out of the environment bill or indeed the agriculture bill, both of them now acts. Um, on the environment uh, bill as it was, you know, I went a long way, pushed a long way in getting soil as a focus and soil really does have to be the foundation. Um, and we have to make it possible for farmers to look after their soils and increasingly even those who perhaps you know have farmed in very um, mainstream ways in the past are turning to the organic sector to the agroecological sector and looking for alternatives but they're finding it really hard to find those alternatives so you know I think 
what we have to do is regard this as a partnership. And the same thing as I've just been saying to the to Paul's boys, I'll, I'll say to you now, um, where we are now is profoundly unstable. That's economically, environmentally, politically true. What we got out of COP wasn't really enough, but there were two COPs. The official COP was very disappointing, but the unofficial COP, which was the campaigners, the young people on the streets, the scientists who were offering real alternative ways and real alternative ways of food production living within the planetary limits. You know, they were there, they have the ideas. We're talking about innovation. And the innovation, you know, I think is a word we really have to recapture. It's too often seen as business as usual with different technology, big shiny things, you know, things happening in test tubes. Um, the soil nature is an amazing, productive, rich resource if we allow it to flourish. And that really needs to be the foundation of our food production, the foundation of our land use. And I will just mention actually quite excitingly just this week, just hot off the press, is we're going to actually have a land use inquiry, a special committee looking at that next year in the Lord. So that's something for people to watch out for. There's a lot happening. This is top of the agenda. A real challenge we're going to have in these months after COP is the government is going to, I've no doubt, going to try and say, oh, with climate, we've done, we've done climate now. You know, we've done environment. We've got the environment bill and the agriculture bill. All of us can get out there and get the message out that we still need massive change. And that's a different kind of food system, very much relocalized, very much based on working with nature instead of trying to cosh it over the head with a club. Um, that means agroecology, it means organic, it means um, creating systems that pay people a decent wage and enable people to work a reasonable amount of hours. All of these things are a big system change. And you know, I really look forward to working with all of you. I'm there as a resource in the House of Lords. If something the government's doing is really annoying you, get in contact with me. I can ask written questions. We're there to make the arguments, to make the case, um, because the ideas are out there. We just need to put them into implementation. Thanks very much. Thanks, Natalie. That was really inspiring. And there'll be a chance to ask Natalie questions after the next speaker, who I am now going to introduce, and is James Woodward, who's going to talk to us about the policy context in England and Scotland. James works for Sustain as a sustainable farming officer with a focus on agroecology, farming, local food and supply chains. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, Susie, and thank you to the, uh, Oxford, uh, the Northern Real Farming Conference for having me along today to talk about farming policy in England and Scotland. And it's a real pleasure to follow on from Natalie, who has been such a great advocate for agroecological and regenerative farming um, in the UK. Um, yeah, so today I'll be I'll be going over some of the kind of the policy context of farming in England and Scotland. Uh, before I do, um, I just want to caveat that it's currently very complex. There's all sorts of things in the mix. Uh, there's a lot of details still to come out um, and things are going to change potentially quite considerably over the over the next few years. But I'll try to give a bit of a flavour um, as to as to where we are. So oh, just try and move it along. So um, first, I wanted to try and highlight the different approaches that are being taken in England and Scotland. Um, First of all, I think it's fair to say that um, the UK government are taking quite a different um, approach from what we had under the common agricultural policy. Um, they're diverging quite a lot from that and they're doing it much um, quicker than Scotland are. Um, whereas in Scotland, uh, it very much feels more like integrating the, the schemes that um, existed under the common agricultural policy and kind of reworking them into more domestic versions, at least for now. And that's because the kind of the recent Scottish Agriculture Act does um, have an amendment in it, um, which uh, basically says that the Scottish government is going to have to publish a report by uh, December 2024 at the very latest, setting out any kind of new future farming policies and schemes and regulations that they want to introduce. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning that um, what's happening in the farming policy bubble um, is very much being pulled in, in similar but also slightly different directions um, due to sort of various other policy type stuff that's going on at the moment. Um, as Natalie mentioned, we've had the Agriculture Act and the Environment um, Act come into place. Um, very much kind of looking at farming in different ways and, and pulling them in similar but different directions. And then there's also a lot of kind of stuff that government is doing um, because of the net zero um, pledges and, and the net zero strategy they've just uh, released 
and things like the 20, 25 year environment plan, um, which again is, is uh, kind of pulling farming in, in similar but different directions. And also we've just had the national food strategy. Um, and it doesn't really feel like these things are all joining up very well. Um, and that's a bit of an issue. And it's part of the reason why there's so much kind of com uh, complexity and confusion going on at the moment. But that's just a bit of a, a background to the different approaches in England and Scotland there. Um, some of the kind of headliners, just to give you a, a flavour of what's going on to show that difference. Well, in England, the, uh, the government are taking um, the approach of something called environmental land management, which I'm sure all of you or, or most of you have already heard about, as it's kind of been in the, uh, in the mix for a number of years now. But this is um, changing farming from what it was under CAP, where um, a lot of the payments were kind of support, income support type payments with some agri-environment payments more towards kind of supporting um, environmental stuff. And it will be split between three schemes. Um, eventually, the sustainable farming incentive that will pay farmers to take more sustainable farming land practices up. The local nature recovery scheme that, that will pay farmers to manage habitats and potentially link them up with neighboring farms. And the landscape recovery scheme, which will pay landowners, sort of slightly large landowners to do more nature recovery, um, rewilding type projects. And then there's also going to be, or what is already in place, the Agricultural Transition Plan, uh, which is kind of a whole series of different grants and support mechanisms around productivity and business resilience. There's even an, an exit scheme, which um, is designed to help far, uh, farmers retire from farming. It's a slightly strange one, which I don't have time to go into, but it's, um, it's a slightly odd kind of scheme uh, in my kind of eyes and then there's all there's there's potentially going to be some support for things like new entrants but a lot of that is still in the development phase all of all of that really is still in the development phase um, and there's a lot of kind of piloting of this stuff going on and then there's supposed to be this new regulatory framework coming through eventually but again there's very minimal details on this whereas in Scotland I think Scottish farmers will um, kind of see something very similar to what they've had in in the past few years there's not a huge amount of change, as I said, there, there's more of a integrating cap schemes into Scotland in, in domestic versions. So Scottish farmers will be able to access at least over the next few years, basic payment scheme and, and the agri-environment climate scheme, which is all about you know, getting farmers to take options up, up to, um, to try and benefit wildlife and climate. And what I, th there's all sorts of other ones. There's loads of um, different grants and schemes um, that fit into the Scottish farming uh, policy landscape. But some just to show the difference um, that, that Scotland is kind of taking from England, that there's more support for more sort of smaller farms and crofting and that traditional kind of crofting farming. And um, so, yeah, there's, there's quite a difference um, in England. You know, farmers will still be able to access um, BPS money, although it's reducing down, whereas in Scotland it's staying as is. Um, and there will still be the countryside stewardship scheme up until 2024. Um, all of this stuff is kind of, as I said, up in the air. I mean, the environmental land management, it's not supposed to be rolled out in full until 2024, but you will see um, sort of very narrow versions of the schemes and pilots of the schemes happening in England over the, over the next coming years. So just my, my last slide, really, I, I wanted to try and paint a picture of what farmers might expect from all of this. Um, I think, as I've already mentioned, it's fair to say in Scotland, um, it might not feel like a lot of change at first, but I think there'll be lots of kind of consultations and lots of discussions going on about what farming policy and schemes and, and regulations might look like after 2024. Um, I think farmers in both countries will, will find that it's a very complex policy situation. There's loads of different schemes and grants in play. Some are coming in for a couple of years and then they go away. Others will come in and they'll go away. And I think it's, you know, having spoken to loads of farmers over the last kind of year, two years, I think they're finding it really difficult to understand which schemes would work for them and, and what they should go go into and what, should, what they should try out. So I think there's a real role for um, organisations like ourselves and also the government to try and actually help farmers find um, a way forward that's a lot more easier to understand. Um, expect loads of testing and trialling and piloting of these schemes to, to happen over the next couple of years. Um, so, so with that, I would say, you know, what they look like today um, probably won't be what they look like by 2024 in England with, with the environmental land management. Um, and I'm sure the, the same process will happen in Scotland um, when, when they publish the report on what changes they'll make. 
There's also this kind of so-called, I've, I've put it in quotation marks, co-design process, because I think unfortunately um, the, the government in England um, have taken this co-design process up, but they've done it in, in not a very, in a bit of a limp-wristed way. But there are opportunities for farmers to get involved in the design of schemes beyond just actually being involved in the, in the ELM pilots. And I'd really encourage farmers to do that. I think it's crucial that farmers' voices are heard in this and the actual these, these things are ground truth, as it were. And sort of finally, um, the, the, just to kind of give a, an idea of where the budget is and, and things like that, because I think it's important to understand what money is, is going to be in the schemes. Well, the budget is guaranteed up until 2024, which is about £3 billion each year for the UK. And I think that splits roughly into about £1.7 billion in England and five, uh, about £450 million in Scotland. I know there's some top-up payments that are given to Wales and Scotland, so it, it probably equals a little bit more than that £450. But that will be there for the next couple of the next three years. After that, it's kind of anyone's guess really as to what what kind of public money will go into into supporting farmers to deliver for nature, for climate, for health, for new entrants and all of that stuff. Um, hopefully, they'll they'll put more into it because I think you know farming has very much been an un, a sort of an undervalued thing in in kind of policy making for for too long. And finally, without kind of going into too much detail, but I think, again, it's something that's really important to bear in mind with the success of how all of these changes work out is, is where we go, where the UK goes with signing new trade deals. And unfortunately, the, the current trajectory with what's been signed with, um, in principle, with New Zealand and Australia um, is really, uh, there's a real concern that it will undermine uh, British food and farming standards. And it'll undermine the economic viability of, of British farms, which tends to be smaller um, at the moment. And I think uh, if those trade deals, carry, if that trajectory carries on with countries like the USA and Brazil and um, other big agricultural nations, I think we might find that a lot of these policies might, might not be as successful as we need them to be because British farmers, UK farmers, will be forced into um, making decisions about whether to go more intensive and to amalgamate more land into their business and things like that? Or do they go down the more niche kind of markets, which there aren't always going to be you know, many of those, at least under what we have with the supply chain situation at the moment. So it's really just something to bear in mind within the wider policy context. But um, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for listening to me kind of ramble on there. Uh, if you want to drop me an email, please do. And yeah, I think we might be taking some questions at some point. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, and yeah, now there is a chance to ask both Natalie and James questions. So if you'd have a question, please either use the reaction button at the bottom of the screen to raise your hand or type it into the chat. So does anyone have any questions? And you're very welcome to unmute yourself and ask it live if you do. I can't see anything any coming through yet. So I guess I've got a couple. Um, the first one is how can how can we as a community of farmers and uh, um, supporters of farming in the north um, support the policy developments and changes that are important to us? What sort of would be your top tips? Well, I think if I can come in on that, I mean, um, I've just oddly enough been talking to the boys of St Paul's saying, you know, you have to make politics what you do not have done to you. And, you know, you might feel like between, you know, dealing with the lambing, dealing with all of the other farm jobs, you've got more than enough on. But you, know, it's really time to step up and, you know, even just writing a letter to the local paper, stressing what the issues are for you, um, writing to your MP, getting involved, getting engaged. You know, it's, uh, we just, you know, cannot trust the government, current government. You know, James is absolutely right that the trade deals are a huge issue. And it's interesting that, you know, the, the NFU a kind of constituency, you would expect the Conservative Party to very much, you know, be listening to. They were very strong in opposition to what was happening with the trade deals, and yet it happened anyway. But I think there's also a real philosophical argument to be made here. The government is very much going towards the, um, the, the idea of, you know, we're going to spare some of the land and trash the rest of it. The sparing versus sharing debate is something that I don't think the public has really, you know, got a handle on yet. And so writing to pay to local papers, I mean, I saw someone, you, uh, you know, people involved in community supported agriculture, really educating communities about how food is grown and how it can be grown differently, what the problems are with, with the current mainstream systems. 
you know, all of those are things that, that spending time doing that is time very well spent um, because there's not much public understanding at the moment and there's a lot of public fear and concern about being able to put food on the table, keep a roof over their head. And so getting the public in the conversation is something that everyone can get involved with, even at a very small local kind of scale. Thanks, Natalie. James, did you want to add something? Um, just very quickly, I think just to echo what Natalie was saying, that um, we, I think that we have to remember that there is a, there is a political element to agroecology and, and what agroecology is about. It's a movement, it's about getting grassroots and people involved in, in the politics side of farming and politics isn't for everybody. But I think it's really important that people um, express their frustrations and that they also express what they really want to see happening. And I think farmers need to, not need to, but I think farmers could, you know, find ways of doing that as a community, especially the agroecological regenerative agriculture farmers in the UK could look at coming together and really, um, you know, trying to say, you know, push for those changes and say, say what they want to see happening in the UK. And I think the other thing just to, just to touch on is that, you know, there's there's this co-design process going on with all of the new schemes. And I think farmers should try and find as many opportunities to get involved in that. But they should also be pushing for that co-design process to be even deeper and more meaningful for them in, in policy. And they should be highlighting those frustrations constantly, because I think there's always a problem with policymaking that it doesn't always talk to the people who it's going to affect. Um, so, yeah, I think that's another kind of really important thing that you know farmers and, and people representing farmers can can seek to do. Thanks, James. Um, there's a question from Ruth West. Ruth, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hello. It's fairly straightforward, please. My ears pricked up when you said land use inquiry. I want to know more, please, because obviously um, a land commission, but certainly a land tax, all sorts of, we really need to change the agenda for land. Thanks. Yeah, well, I guess that's directed at me um, to start off with. Um, I mean, this this is um, Baroness uh, Pickering, who's actually you know driven this. So, so the House of Lords has regular sort of short term uh, commissions, and there's four of them. The land use one is one of them, and it will start in January. Um, and this really comes out of debates around the um, Environment Bill, and we did have amendments um, put down. Uh, calling for a land use um, strategy. There is one in Wales and in Scotland. I, I confess I don't know a great deal about the one in Scotland. Um, I don't know if James says any more, but you know, they have a plan and it's an acknowledgement of, um, you know, the sort of figures show that if you look at you know, some of the government's strategies, things like the 25 year environment plan, it kind of seems like we need about 1.3 UKs for all of the different things that land's supposed to be dedicated for. And so we need to think about how we can share the land for different purposes, how we can ensure that land's used for its best possible purpose. Um, and so, you know, the model exists there in Wales and in Scotland. And so this is very much an English thing. And the government kind of goes, oh, you know, ideologically speaking, their response is, oh, this is, um, you know, a government control centralized thing. But this is actually saying, you know, land is a resource uh, in which we all have an interest. We all have concern. And, you know, I spend quite a lot of time talking about the issues around driven grouse shooting um, and the fact that, you know, people cannot be allowed to manage land in ways that threatens their neighbours' life and well-being. you know, things like not storing carbon, increasing flooding. And you know, we really have to get to a point of saying, you know, how do we use our land? How do we protect our land? How do we ensure that people are safe and fed? And that's, that's what this is getting at. So, I mean, you know, watch this space will be um, certainly, you know, my Twitter feed will, will have information about that. It will have hearings. It will hear testimony, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be trying to get in, o, o, onto that. Um, there's a bit of an issue in that basically there's no system for which smaller parties can actually become part of these House of Lords committees. But I'm pushing to change that. Um, uh, and but even if I'm not involved in it, I'll certainly be you know, trying to inform people, let people know. It'll be taking testimony. We really want to make sure agroecological and regenerative agriculture as perspectives are heard in that, that testimony and that outcome. And, you know, House of Lords committees have a very good reputation for producing good reports, so it should hopefully be a really useful report. But it's just to clarify, it's the level of a House of Lords committee then. It's not a commission that's part of the Act or anything like that. No, no, no. It, it's, it's simply a committee, like, like it's sort of like a common select committee, but this is a short term one for a particular purpose. So, it, you know, it's not, this is not something set up by the government. It's not an official thing. It will be a House of Lords independent voice. 
Uh, and that means, you know, it doesn't mean that we're going to see the government coming up with an English land use strategy anytime soon, but it does mean there's a chance to get some really good work done and some really good perspectives uh, put into an sort of official document that can then be really used in future debates. That's fascinating. Thanks so much. And um, Natalie, um, Hannah Fields just, uh, oh, she would like to just uh, add a question on to the end of that. Hannah, do you want to unmute and, and ask? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Natalie. It's great to hear about everything that you're doing, kind of pushing for agroecology. Um, I work for the Food Farming and Countryside Commission, and it reminded me of the land use framework recommendation, which is being piloted in um, Cambridgeshire and down in Devon. And I just wondered if you knew about the land use framework recommendation and whether um, that might inform the inquiry. I, I think it certainly will. I mean, this is kind of something that will be starting from scratch, you know, making a call for evidence. So, you know, very much watch out for that. And I'm sure I'm sure that will, you know, get get being heard there. I would expect someone to be testifying in the in the inquiries from it. Um, so it's part of the process. But it kind of it will start really with an overview. Kind of the, the report will start with a clean slate, and then aim to. Um, I think it runs for nine months. So sort of you know the end of next year there should be a report out. That will draw on where what we have, where we are now, and we'll also be looking towards where we might be going. Thank you. And Rod, would you like to unmute and ask the question you've put in the chat? Hello, Natalie. Um, I was just really wondering how you think the UK government will respond to the the UN Food Summit strategy, um, because it it sort of has some really good parts about it with the <clears throat> sort of following natural farming systems and, and looking at nature very effectively. But do you think the UK government will end up hiding behind the pesticide lobby? Um, I think the, the nature of, you know, the track record of the UK government in terms of UN things is um, is not very high. You know, they, you know, they, they, they like to call themselves world leading so they don't have to listen to anyone else. So, you know, of course you can use it and it's a tool, but I wouldn't put any great hopes in them suddenly going, Oh, well, this is what the world says, so this is what we need to do. Thank you. So do keep the questions coming. I can't see any others right at the moment, but do raise your hand if you have one. I guess another question I'd like to ask is uh, to both of you is if you have any thoughts on how we reconcile the opportunities to great trade globally and the need for culturally appropriate foods which aren't possible to produce in the UK, with the need for a transformed local food system. I'm, I'm happy to, to quickly come in, Susie, and say that absolutely, I think there's space for both global trade, um, but also a, a strong kind of movement of agroecology in, in countries um, all over the world. And I think it's, as you said, it's important in terms of uh, people being able to access culturally appropriate foods. I think the important thing is making sure trade deals align with kind of the principles around climate and nature and health and that um, they don't end up pulling farming, uh, kind of undermining the, the, the standards that we have and um, undermining the process of, of improving those standards eventually. Thanks, James. Um, any other final questions before we move on to our next speaker? So Natalie is going to leave us now. Uh, James will be here at the end so he can take more questions. Looks like we don't have any more right now. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's the first of, of the three speakers who are talking around reimagining the future. So Abby Bagley is going to talk to us about new models for ownership and funding. Abby is director of Kindling Farm and has worked with the John Lewis Partnership as a democracy coach for nine years, working on membership engagement and democratic governance. She has extensive HR experience, particularly in management training and employee rights, as well as employee well-being. Abby is also a member of the Employee Ownership Association, who are currently working in partnership with Co-ops UK on hashtag one million owners. Abby spent six months on secondment at Kindling, helping with the development of the Kindling Farm Project, particularly looking at their community shares campaign. She has an in-depth knowledge of the Kindling Farm rules, business plan, membership offer and shares campaign plan. So over to you, Abby.
I'll be you there. Can't hear you. Is that better? Yeah, great. Thanks. Put my mic on properly. So, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, as Susie said, I'm one of the Kindling Farm directors, um, a non executive director. So, it's not my day job. I still work for John Lewis Partnership. Um, so, I'm one of the over 600 now members we've got. Um, so I, I'm, the reason I'm part of it is I'm, I'm passionate about sustainable farm, like farming and hopefully I can share a bit of that passion with you today. Um, but the caveat is I'm not an expert, um, but I hope to be and, and we hope to be in Kindling Farm as we go through our journey. Um, so a little bit about our vision. So this is our, our vision. So we know that the mainstream food system is responsible for over 25% of our carbon emissions, not to mention the huge impact of increasingly industrialized farming on biodiversity. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can learn to farm and eat in a different way, which is why we're setting up Kindling Farm. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And um, I should say thank you to Natalie for championing the, the Kindling Trust and those of you who might have heard of the Kindling Trust. So um, just a bit about our relationship to the Kindling Trust. Um, we are a, um, an offshoot, I should say, um, of the Kindling Trust. They're sort of our, um, our funders, our drivers to get to where we want to be. But the Kindling Farm is going to be a separate or is now a separate entity, um, a fully community owned um, farm in the northwest. And I'll go into what that actually looks like. Um, so yeah, so Kindling Farm is about growing food, but it's also about growing hope. It's a be, be about creating a food eco economy rooted in fairness and sustainability. One that values the farmers and producers of, of our food, respects and nurtures the land and wildlife and puts the health and well-being of our community at its heart. Kindling Farm will be a place where together we can support the next generation of farmers, increasing access to fresh, organic, veg for all, pioneer the most ecological farming methods and support others to create social change in their own communities. And we have reasons to be hopeful. And firstly, that is because of the groundwork that the Kindling Trust has done um, over the last 14 years through their work in Greater Manchester. And I just wanna share some of the stuff that has been done over that time to get us to where we are today. So we've grown supply through um, our Farm Start Manchester Growing New Growers, which again, I think um, Natalie was talking about. So that is supporting people who want to become farmers to learn about how to do organic farming and how to run a commercial scale organic farm. We've been growing demand, so that's through our cooperatives, um, including Manchester Veg People, uh, which is a workers co-op um, which brings together local farms around Manchester um, and connects them with uh, restaurants, markets um, and um, connects them to market. And that also links with um, the other co-op, which is Veg Box People, which is our customer veg box scheme. Um, which again works with that Manchester veg people uh, co-op and brings that veg to direct customers through a veg box scheme. And also increased access and engagement to um, local organic veg through our Woodbank Community Food Hub, which is based in Stockport. Um, we run so social prescribing um, sessions. So that's where uh, people from the community um, get prescribed well-being um, through their GP and they come and do a course at Woodbank and they learn to grow and then learn to cook the food that they've grown. Um, it's a fantastic initiative and they also get to take home um, some of the veg from the veg box scheme. So that's um, what we've been building on over the last 14 years. Um, and that's why it's a real natural progression for us to scale up our work to date so that we can produce more local organic food both in volume, variety, and for longer, and to engage more people, both in access to organic veg and involvement in creating that change. So what is Kindling Farm? How are we gonna do it? 
so we're establishing a large scale pioneering agroforestry farm just outside of Greater Manchester to significantly increase the availability of local organic fruit and vegetables, improving health and well-being through increased access to fresh food and offering a rich programme of training and community building activities. It will eventually also become home to a centre for social change where we'll be able to promote and support the transition to low carbon, more socially and ecologically just world and um, also a social enterprise hub where we'll be able to have some shared facilities and collaborative working opportunities um, where we could do some of that sort of secondary and tertiary um, side of agriculture. Um, and we know never has concern around the climate and e ecological crisis been so strong and by establishing a farm owned by its members and by giving communities a voice together we can demonstrate that there are achievable solutions. And we know there's a lot to do, but the other reason to be hopeful is that people want it to happen and want to be involved. So this spring in April, it was delayed by a year due to um, the pandemic. But this year, we opened our community shares campaign with a target to raise £390,000. And we raised over £1 million. And we got just over 600 members. And the motivations that people told us that um, the reasons why they wanted to invest in, in our farm was they wanted more local organic food. Um, some wanted the hope that things can change and others joined because that a better, they wanted a better food system and they wanted to know that it was possible. Um, and others wanted to learn and do it elsewhere. So learn from us and do it in their own area. And when we launched our campaign early this year, uh, we did have a farm that we uh, were quite far along on purchasing, but unfortunately the seller did fall through. It was very interesting hearing Natalie talk about the challenges of getting uh, land because that is exactly the place we're at now. Um, and at that point, we did go out to members who had already invested and also to people who were then going to invest to say, you know, this is where we're at. Um, but everyone was, was still with us on the journey. Um, and yeah, they, they still want to make it a success. So since then, we've been visiting a number of farms on the market, and that's moving us closer and closer to finding the one that will become Kindling Farm. Um, the, the aim is to get a farm before the year is out from when our community shares campaign closed in June, so by summer next year. Um, and that very much is the challenge. And just a sort of personal reflection from me on that is in, in visiting the farms with the other directors to try and find somewhere that we could we could purchase. The challenge of finding, um, firstly, a, a farmer that will sell the, ho the whole farm, the buildings and the, the land. Um, found quite a few cases where they're, they're willing to, to sell the land, which isn't working for them anymore, um, but still wanted to hold on to the buildings and um, therefore it's, it's, it's very difficult for new farmers to get into a farm because where are you going to live, where are you going to do, where are you going to store your equipment, where are you going to um, process all your, um, your um, crops. So that's quite an interesting um, perspective to have got from visiting all the farms that we have been. Um, and also just the, fluctu the fluctuation, the variance in the value of land and, and people's farms. Um, it seems to be quite varied. Um, and very dependent on what the farmer wants to get rather than necessarily the, the market value. And um, yeah, that's brought some challenges. So that's just a bit of a personal reflection. But we are very, we are hopeful that we will find somewhere um, because we've got that um, cash reserve now to be able to go in with that real bargaining power. Um, and um, yeah, create a, a new food system in the Northwest. And just some little bits in numbers about the social impact of the Kindling Farm. Um, of, of how we can not just impact the, the sort of uh, farming side of it, but also the social side. And I should just mention that while we're looking for the, the land, we haven't stopped the work we're doing. So we have currently got an agroforestry team of four. Um, they would be able to talk much more about the agroforestry side of it. Um, but they are currently planting uh, 12,000 trees and half of those trees are going to community um, 
orchards or gardens or centres uh, around the northwest, and the other half will be going onto the Kindling Farm to form our agroforestry system. So that nursery is already planted um, and they're already growing, they're in the, in the ground. Um, so again, it's really great to see it starting to come to fruition. And finally, just if you'd like to learn any more about our project, um, you can go to our website um, where we've got lots of latest news about where we're up to. Again, the agroforestry team um, talk about what they're up to and we have a newsletter that you can sign up to. That's all from me, thank you. Thanks, Abby. That was, yeah, again, really inspiring. And there will be a chance to ask Abby questions um, once we've heard from two more speakers. So I'm going to introduce the next speaker, who is Nick Renison, who's also talking on reimagining the future, um, a voice from the uplands. Nick Renison is a regenerative farmer from Renison's Farm in the Eden Valley. She raises cows, sheep, pigs and hens and focuses on pasture fed approaches and increasing biodiversity. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Can you see some yes. eggs? Yes, that's great. <laughs> thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much to the Northern Real Farm Conference for um, for giving me this slot. I, it, it's 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 a good chance to um to, to speak about stuff we're quite passionate about. Um, so just a quick bit about me first. So I um, farm with my husband Paul um, at Canahuf, which is about half an hour from Penrith on the on the East Pennines. Um, we've we, we, over the last we've been here for ten years, and over the last ten years we've kind of changed the direction we're going in. But this slide kind of gives you an idea of of what's happening at the minute. So we've got um, different kind of layers of, of, of enterprises. Um, from from eggs to uh, grass fed beef and, and we're kind of getting more into the wildlife side of stuff and also in the middle uh, are the kids which um, uh, that was a, a picnic after some tree planting which looks quite jolly but there's a lot of moaning going on but it's it's also so I think as just a reflection that um, we're we're farming, but we also feel quite privileged that we're able to bring our kids up in this environment and we don't farm to become millionaires. It's, 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 there's a whole um, load of good things that come along with um, getting blown away on a on an East Fell side. So if I just that that gives you an idea of, of where we are. Um, so we're in the in the distance. It's um, the Lake District district. So although we haven't got any common land, We've got 360 acres of fairly upland pasture, 130 acres, and that's where the cows are there, is, um, is really quite rough, rough land. We call it allotment, um, but we don't have any open common. And then in the, for, in the, in the distance there, you see um, the Eden Valley. And um, I used to think that that was a great view. And now I unfortunately just see a monoculture of... Um, uh, fir plantations and uh, rye grass and hedges so my, my kind of thought process has changed about that and then there's a bit of tree planting in in the foreground um but just I, to, i'm going to talk about my vision of the uplands um which i feel i may be talking to the converted here and I hope there's some people I can converse on on the call. But the, the, currently, I think we, we need to have a look where we're heading to currently with this government. Um, and this screen, I think, just just highlights that um, visually quite well in that that they're, they're hell bent on planting trees to um, sort out the uh, climate change thing. So it's a lot about tree planting and then putting nature in a, in a little box. Um, and then on the other side, you've got hardcore intensive food production. And we, we live in, uh, and then you've got uh, the Tesco's where they make up names of farms. I just can't get my head around that. Um, and everything's very faceless and it's all packaged very nicely and, and nameless. Um, and, 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 and then on the, so we've got a government that don't really care much about food and food production. And it's like a fuel that you just put in the tank. Um, and then they want to plant trees. And, and the, the lobby group that the, that's got the kind of biggest ear of the government um, are obsessed with feeding the world and the kind of um, production agriculture. 
and that we're going to have feed add additives and technology similar to what Natalie said technology is going to save the day and then it, it's obviously a very centralized food food system so um, and, and COVID has has highlighted the weaknesses of a centralized food system really well um, we've got an obesity epidemic um, we, we don't tell people about food we don't tell people in schools how food is is produced um, and I don't think I don't think the government and, and industry really want to tell people how how food is produced uh, and then we, and we've also got a huge mental health epidemic of people sitting like I am now looking at a screen um, but people in office blocks with and they never touch touch the land so that's but and I think that is uh, unfortunately where we're heading we're looking to import food from the most intensive countries uh, agricultural um, some people in in the in the world and um but we, we're going to have um, public money for public goods and we're all going to be um, sitting pretty in this country. So, and, and all this is in the background of COP26 and um, climate emergency. And, 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 and I, I, I think I am talking to the converted here, but as, as we get hotter and wetter, people are going to migrate and, and we really are heading for a pickle. And I, to be very deep about it, I, I wouldn't want my gr grandchildren, if I have any, to say, why didn't you do anything? So my vision for the uplands is, is a regenerative revolution, which isn't very good when you can't pronounce your R's. Uh, and I think, it, I think it's happening. I think, it, I think it's, it's a growing movement. And I think the consumer is becoming more aware of this. Um, we, we started our move to um, regenerative farming through rotational grazing and I think the whole system regenerative farming is quite in the arable sector it's all cover crops and and direct drilling but I think for, for us it starts in the uplands it's got to be we've got to all become obsessed with with grass and ruminants eat grass and they shouldn't really eat anything else so this is a very simple slide but it's just I see it as a very circular economy where we can have all of these things so we can have biodiversity we can have in some areas rewilding I don't I'm not overly keen on full rewilding but there are some areas that are, are absolutely no good for anything else and they can soak up water and it's also it's also a huge agritourism um, um, opportunity which I, I think we're missing at the minute we we recently walked up um, a very famous fell in the Lake District and there's nothing to there's no wildlife there at all absolutely none it's void of wildlife and I, I think um, I don't think people come to the Lake District to see wildlife they come to maybe see Herdwick sheep but they don't come to see and, and it it could be there if if, if you know um, the, the right trees and plants were there to support the life uh, timber production. I think we um, we do need to to grow timber, uh, and I, I think we we're just offloading the the problem to another country if we if we just expect to import our timber. So I think timber production is part of the mix. Um, I think food production is is a is something we can do in the uplands, but I think it's got to be affordable food production for local people. Um, Agroforestry is we've, we've planted lots of hedges and um, we're looking at doing alleyways with fruit and nuts. Um, and the, w where we are particularly is largely a treeless, hedgeless environment. And I think um, we can um, we can do a lot more there. And then this is just a patchwork. And I, I, that's how I see that the uplands in the future, um, well, how I'd like to see the uplands in the future is a patchwork of all kinds of different things. So there's room for everybody. And it's instead of farms getting bigger, um, and, and I think intensification of farms is a huge problem. A huge amount of animals on a concrete pad is, is only a recipe for disaster. Um, I think we need to have small farms and, um, and they need to be financially um, supported and I think we need more people on farms I've got a we've got a name for this place that will have lots and lots of different things going on here and people will come here and there'll be a, a very positive vibe right rather than just a, a backwater um, it needs to be a happening place so for example local butchers shops um, I've got uh, I just an idea that the Lake District could be slightly de-sheeped 
air, in areas and, and we could start having micro dairies and, and um, make cheeses and, and all that lends into agritourism really well um, and local jobs for local people. Um, and then, so just in summary, I think um, the government are going to be half-hearted about this and they, uh, they don't, it, we live in a capitalist society and this doesn't suit that, that type of mentality. So um, it's a very much a ground up movement. And I think we need um, lots more peer-to-peer -peer learning. Farmers learn best from other farmers. And this was a meeting we had on soil at our place. And you know, those chaps in the photo, they're not spring chickens and they're genuinely interested in learning about soil and they've been farming all their lives and they're open to it. So I think we need to, to, to run with this. Um, my husband Reno says, we, we, once you've done one thing, it's like a drug regenerative farming. Once you're one step on the ladder, then you just keep on wanting more. So it's just getting that first step on the ladder. Um, we need to redirect a lot of the money that comes into farming. Uh, I think lots of it goes for pointless, pointless, um, for example, pointless tree planting in our area, which is planted at huge cost and then it is not maintained. Um, and there's huge knowledge, knowledge gaps. We're currently trying to learn a lot about compost, composting, and um, it just highlights that when you go and try and find out something about composting, that there's a limited knowledge out there. Um, and finally, um, again, quite deep, but do, we're doing this for our great great grandchildren. So don't I've spelled that wrong too. Sorry. Um, it it's. Um, I think we're the generation where we're possibly going to um, miss the chance. And, and I think um, we need to grasp the, grasp the nettle. And that is it. Thank you, Nick. Again, another really inspiring presentation. And there will be a chance to ask Nick questions after the next and final speaker, who is Lynn Barnes from Vista Edge. And she is going to speak to us again on Reimagining the Future, A Voice from the Field. Lynn is part of Istaveg, a small growers co-op based in the village of Crosby Ravensworth near Shap in Cumbria. They grow high quality, responsibly grown vegetables on three separate sites, totaling six acres. And they grow those vegetables for people who care about where and how their food is produced. They operate a box scheme for families and individuals and also sell wholesale to businesses and community groups. Lynn is also involved in Homegrown Here, a new initiative as part of Zero Carbon Cumbria. Thanks, Lynn. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, as Susie says, uh, we have a small veg box scheme um, and we are a growers cooperative uh, based in a very gorgeous part of, of Cumbria, um, along with Nick Fair in the Eden Valley. Um, we've been doing this for about 14 years now and started off very small, uh, just with 20 families who wanted to um, for us to grow veg for them. And that's increased now. Uh, we have 250 box scheme members who receive either a weekly or a fortnightly bag of, of fresh veg from us. Um, we deliver to the doorstep and we operate within a sort of 12 to 15 mile radius of our, our growing site. Uh, we, all, we all grow ourselves on our own land. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a different model to maybe some of some of the others that you might be familiar with. Um, so we grow on our own land, but then also communally um, on, a, on a shared site with uh, shared polytunnels and a two and a half acre field and, and um, orchard as well. Um, we also work with schools, helping them to set up um, growing spaces uh, within their school grounds and lead after school clubs. Um, we run Grow Your Own Veg courses because we're not pressed about keeping that knowledge to ourselves. Um, apple pressing days and we take part in Open Farm Sunday as well. We work closely with our local food banks um, and um, our box team members cannot to donate their veg bags if they're away on holiday. And we make sure that that uh, gets to the local food banks. Um, we also work with Bernardo's um, around um, healthy eating and getting fresh fruit and veg out to um, those families that are in greater need, but also with Bernardo's support to, to help um, cook and prepare meals from scratch. 
and we take healthy start vouchers as well for um, families with children under five uh, on benefits. Um, we additionally do a little bit of consultancy sometimes uh, when the occasion uh, arises on community food growing projects. Um, as Susie said, we grow responsibly and because we're a bit of a kind of disparate group growing on all different bits and pieces of land, uh, we're not certified organic because that would be quite complicated for us to all uh, to all be certified and, and put our produce into our veg bags. Um, and we commit to supplying our box team members year round um, and with eight, at least eight items in their veg bags each week. Um, and we source uh, anything that we can't grow ourselves or choose not to grow ourselves um, as locally as possible. And therein lies the rub, really, because um, the, over perhaps the last five or six years that we've been doing this, it's become increasingly difficult to identify uh, locally grown veg. And when I mean local, I'm talking within the county of Cumbria, which, of course, is a huge county. Um, but um, it, it, for various reasons, it's been um, increasingly difficult. And I know that... Um, People who have grown in the past, really uh, quite brilliant market gardeners locally, have, have given over, they've retired, they've positively discouraged their, uh, their next generation to take that forward as a, as a career, um, or they've sold their land to housing development. Um, and so, it, yes, we found it very difficult. Um, so an opportunity arose uh, last year to be part of um, a bigger countywide project. Um, and we're part of a, a partnership called Zero Carbon Cumbria. And the aim of the partnership, uh, which is pretty much all the great and good around the table in Cumbria, um, public, private, and third sector agencies and organizations, county councils, the National Trust, the National Park, uh, district authorities, NHS Cumbria, cellar fields, lots and lots of people around this table, all with the ambition to achieve carbon neutral in Cumbria by 2037. So uh, as part of this partnership, I thought maybe one of the things we could do um, to try and work towards zero carbon by 2037 was to try and encourage a little more veg growing uh, and fruit growing within, within the county. Um, so uh, we started this in January with a call out through um, local agricultural um, avenues to uh, see whether we could get local farmers uh, much more engaged and switched on to the prospect of growing at least one acre of uh, vegetables or fruit uh, for the next five seasons. Um, there's, a, there's a short film, which um, hopefully I can make this work for you. Um, which will give you a little bit more idea about the project. Um, how do I just share screen? Can everybody see that? Um, is this yeah that's this... great if you can make the screen full screen okay yeah right perfect homegrown here is a, a grower owned cooperative of local producers based in cumbria several growers from around the county growing a variety of, of different fruit and veg. Carrots and potatoes, swedes, turnips, a whole range of peas and French beans. In terms of its growers, Homegrown here will really support them through advice and skills sharing, through providing machinery and equipment, through funding the seed and plant costs up front so that they take less risk themselves at the outset. 
by giving them a, a branding for their farm as part of the homegrown here, generic brand. But also the main thing for them is that homegrown here will create a route to market for all the crops that they produce and in fact will be the single marketplace. Well that's the aim for all fruit and veg that's being produced within the county. Our growers are growing conventionally and organically. That's great for the environment, for responsible growing, growing in harmony with nature. A lot of the crops that they're growing require hand picking, so that's better for the environment and also better for the local economy. We're uh, trying to reduce waste as well. We pick a little bit of wonky veg, not a lot, but we do try and include some. You might get 10 carrots that are perfect, but you might get one that isn't. I think it's important for everybody to understand that they're all perfectly edible, there's no difference. The ones that aren't used, we feed them to the cattle on the farm here, so there is no waste at all. The real benefit is lower food miles, people eating much more seasonally and keeping their purchasing and their commitment to food within the county. Um, so, yes, so that in essence is the project. Um, we're very much um, at the start of this journey. And um, I think we've just in the few months that we've, we've been doing this um, and work and really starting to work together as a, a cohort of growers, we've come to the conclusion that actually the, the growing is the easy part and that what happens post farm gate in terms of direct selling, dealing with wholesalers, public sector procurement, and, and influencing uh, local supply chains is the really tricky part. Um, but ultimately that's totally where the success lies. Um, and we'd really love to nail all that uh, here in Cumbria. Um, I think at the moment we have more questions than answers, but it does feel really exciting because we're all starting to talk about this um, and work together and think what's possible and, and maybe try and kind of change the way the local food system works. Um, and I think if there's an, one message that we really want to get out there post COP26 is that um, every household can do a really simple thing by supply, shortening the supply chain and, and buying local, much simpler than um, solar panels, buying electric car, all those things, brilliant, but actually they're costly, they're time consuming, and uh, a really simple start would be just to start supporting your local, local producers. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn, and thanks to all of our speakers. So we've got about uh, 10, 15 minutes now for questions. So again, if you have a question, either raise your hand using the reactions button or put it into the chat. I can see um, a question already. This one was um, directed uh, for Nick um, from Jane Cooper. Jane, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, is that working? Yeah, great. Excellent. Um, yeah, uh, it's talking about agritourism, which of course, as farmers, we're all being told, this is the future, rewilding and agritourism. But you, we get problems, as we know from all the people going to the countryside with COVID, um, it disturbs the wildlife. And at the moment, Orkney seals are coming up onto the shore. They're giving birth to their pups and people are rushing to see them. And it's actually causing the seals to abandon the pups. So the question is, can agritourism actually generate sufficient income for farmers without destroying the environment and the very wildlife that people are paying to come and see? Um, thanks, thanks, Jane. It, good question. Um, I, I think, I, I think agritourism is, is part of the mix. And I think, um, for example, the, the seals, seals in Orkney, I think if, if there was more wildlife for people to see, there would be less hotspots because I think it, there's so little for people to see when there is something, they all rush there. And, and I think as, as farmers, um, we, the public are eat our food. And, and I think it, 
th there it is annoying when people leave gates open and you know trample over fields you don't want them to trample over but they, they they buy our food and they also currently um supply us with our payments so i think it's missing it, it, it's it's understanding that that we we can't say you know get off my land we, we've got to educate them and talk to them and build those bridges rather than um um you know there's there's nothing more there's, there's, there's a chap who lives quite close to here who has a small amount of land and he's very protective on that land and and it, it's we, we've we've got to welcome be, be slightly more welcoming i think to people probably been a bit outspoken there but i think we have <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, and yeah, I'd really second that kind of, I mean, from a community sort of agriculture point of view, the connection that people get from coming onto land is, is sort of unbeatable, really. That, that knowing the person that's growing your food and where it's grown is, is a completely different way of looking at food. Um, I can see there's a question from Anne Chapman. Uh, Anne, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Hi, yes. it's. Um... For Kindling Trust, it's, um, I mean, I, I bought shares in Kindling Trust, so I'm very supportive of Kindling Farm, I mean. But I'm interested in, you know, you talk about doing, growing fruit and nuts and uh, vegetables, but what about livestock? And if you're not going to have livestock, where are you going to get the fertility from for growing everything else in, in an organic system, which I also am very supportive of? Thanks, Anne. Yeah, so um, we will not have livestock, we'll be a vegan organic farm, um, which is the same way that we run our currently um, one acre, just over two acres, uh, farm in Woodbank in Stockport. Um, as said, I can't give you the full expertise on it, um, but yes, um, so the, the, the the fertility side of it, obviously agroecology and the agroforestry side of it helps with uh, retention, uh, water retention and nutrient retention, um, crop rotation, like we do currently at our Woodbank site um, and green manure. So we lose, use um, a lot of green manure uh, currently. So that's sort of planting things like clover um, to reintroduce nutrients into the soil. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't be any livestock or uh, livestock byproducts. Thanks, Abby. Um, and uh, Rebecca Lawton, I can see you've got a question. Would you like to unmute and ask it? Hello, yes, I'm an invader from the South here. Um, thank you all of you for really, really inspiring talks. Um, and it was really great to hear how Mr. Bedsheet's progressing. So I had a question for Lynn, which is how does the blend of selling conventional and organic through the same marketing streams work? And do you have a requirement that conventional growers are moving towards an organic approach or do you just let customers know if it's organic or conventional? Thank you very much. I think it's really early days, Rebecca. So we don't quite know how that's going to pan out, but um, at the moment we're sending out an availability list every week to uh, kind of like selected wholesalers on a, on a footprint that we know we can cope with in terms of distribution. Um, and so we would just indicate if something is organic um, and they, they specifically request that, uh, you know, that they would like, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. We, we name the farm that the things from so people can see um, and choose sensibly really, choose the carrots that are closest to you, don't ask for the ones that are further away in the county. Um, uh, and yes, absolutely, we would really like to move all the growers towards a much more responsible way of growing ultimately. And there is a, a training element to this programme for five, over the five years. Um, and it's actually Jane Smith from Growing Well who's going to be kind of underpinning that and uh, which is an or, or organic um, producer. So um, yes, we, we are very, very aware that this is a low carbon project and it, it's about working uh, really sensitively with, with, with nature and the environment. Um, so yes, we were hoping to improve everyone's standards as we travel through the project. Brilliant, thank you. Well, good luck with it. Thank you. 
Thanks, Lynn and Rebecca. Um, please do keep putting questions in or raising hands. Um, I've got another one for all of you, uh, all of the speakers, which is, or the, certainly the three that spoke last. You've all got amazing visions and models. Um, how, how do you suggest that we work collectively in the North to kind of expand this work, to encourage people both to increase demand and to increase people growing, producing in agroecological regenerative ways? Can I pick on that, um, Susie? And it kind of um, touches on the, the previous point just made um, that we can't be exclusive. And I think that's something that's really in, in our vision for Kindling Farm is although we've got a very, um, I guess, disruptive way of wanting to farm and trying to do things different and trying to change the system, we want to do it from the inside. Um, and it links to some, I think I saw another chat saying, you know, join the, the farming unions that already exist and we need to increase our voice within those unions. Um, so yeah, for, I think for us, it's about working with the farmers, you know, that, you, that are next door to you and um, bringing, bringing along the dialogue with everyone and not necessarily going in and saying, you know, organic's the only way or vegan's the only way, because <laughs> uh, we wouldn't want to do that. You know, we're going to be working alongside dairy farmers, potentially, you know, we're in Cheshire. Um, or I live in Cheshire anyway. Um, so I'm surrounded by dairy farmers and they're my neighbours and they're, they're the community that we are going to serve. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it's about um, being inclusive of the people that are currently in those sectors and um, working together um, rather than, than trying to sort of say, you know, we're gonna do it better um, and uh, not bring them on the journey. Thanks, Abby. Nick or Lynn, do you have anything you wanted to add about how we work collectively? Nick? Um, I, yeah, I really agree with, with Abby. I think it's, um, it's bringing everyone with you um, on the journey. I mean, some of my neighbours drive me around the twist. You know, they cut the hedges to a little square box. But, but I, I can remember when, say, seven years ago, I, I, I thought like that. And, and, you know, I couldn't understand why people wanted uh, didn't want Bex to be straightened, and and I think it it is recognizing that um, everyone's on a on a on a separate journey, and we've just got to keep keep pushing. But, uh, and, and the other thing, just um, I I think we we need to talk about the truth quite a lot, and we don't really, well, with Boris, we don't really talk about the truth at all, do we? But I, I think we we, we need to, um, for example, with our egg production people can come and it'll be the same with Lynn's veg. People will be able to see where that, that food is from and how it's grown and actually go into the egg house or go into the vegetable field. Whereas in intensive systems, that's not possible. And, and, and I think it's, we've got to start thinking of food as part of our, of our health um, and, and realize how important it is. Thanks, Nick. Lynn, did you want to add anything else? Um, I would wholly support Nick and, and those ideas. Um, just if, if we can just share, I think I've, I've been doing a lot of trawling around to look at models elsewhere and, um, and, and what's working well in other places. Because what you want, want to do is to be reinventing the wheel. So I think just kind of keeping talking to each other and opportunities like uh, these to bring people together and, and share ideas is, uh, is really invaluable. Um, for us to all move forward together, I think. Thanks, Lynn. Um, and yeah, I, we're, we're nearing the end of this session. So I just wanted to ask all four speakers who are still with us um, for a, a reason to be hopeful, something that they would like to share with, with the audience. Um, and also for all of the audience, if you'd like to put into the chat box um, something you've heard that gives you a reason to be hopeful, that would be great. So uh, maybe I could ask um, Abby to start and then James, Lynn and Nick. Yeah, I think the reason to be hopeful is that um, lots and lots of people believe in this and, and they want to get behind it. Um, they're putting the money where the mouth is and um, yeah, I think people are ready to see a change on the back of last year. Thanks, Abby. Who would like to go next, James? Yeah, don't mind going next. Um, one thing that makes me hopeful is that we're here today 
talking about it at a farming conference and that there are people here today you know wanting to to learn listen and contribute um and i think that's that, you know that's fantastic i think there's a a strong grass, grassroots movement that's building and um just kind of being here today is a very hopeful thing i think thanks james lynn i think it's it's just a time that it feels like a moment of a real change maybe it's just kind of after cop 26 but i think people are changing their attitudes and it well it won't just be cop it will be brexit it will be the pandemic it's i think there's um there's a real hopeful mood and um within yeah within the well certainly i kind of feel that locally and there's a real push particularly in cumbria the, the zero carbon thing is really high on the agenda and um, I, I feel that there's opportunities within uh, certainly our local authorities to make big changes to kind of lobby uh, councillors about you know what, what why why are we making these decisions to to not have every potato on every plate in Cumbria not 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 grown in Cumbria but actually that could really happen um and you know it could happen now with with the producers that are out there and we need to be asking questions about what, why isn't that happening already why are we sourcing from outside in when we've got the sustain the ability to be sustainable within our reach um but I, I'm hopeful that yes it's a moment of, a moment of hope <laughs> thanks Lick. and Nick and I think there is a growing there's a growing demand for local food, and I, and I think that we're finding that um, particularly now. Um, and I think young people, um, I think, like with COP twenty six and stuff, they they are really fired up. My worry is that they all think by going vegan they're going to save the world, but but um, I I think young people won't won't let this pass. And and I I think um, yeah, there's, there's lots of reasons to be hopeful. Thanks, Nick. So, yeah, I'd like to, to thank all of the speakers, Natalie, James, Abby, Nick and Lynn for your hugely inspiring presentations and thoughts. I'd like to thank Ellen for organising the whole conference and I'd like to thank Becky and Martin who have been in the background making sure that the, all of the tech works on this first session of what's going to be a brilliant conference. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating and listening. The message I've taken away is that we're the change as farmers and as consumers and for many of us in joint roles it's our choices that are going to determine and shape our future so thank you and hope to see you at future sessions bye